What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So, we're gonna check out 10 infamous wrestling squash matches. Well, we have seen it time and time again when the WWE is trying to push a particular superstar. A lot of times they will have them be involved in some sort of a squash match. And a lot of times the squash matches are nothing memorable. So, we're gonna check out some of the times where the squash matches were actually quite memorable. Appreciate all the love and support you guys have shown on the channel, man. Let's get right into this. Do the damn thing. Squash matches are supposed to be a standard piece of business. Mm -hmm. Over and done with before you really have time to even think about them. They're not necessarily designed to live long in the memory. Yeah, there like have I just been said. thousands of televised squash matches over the years, and the vast majority of them are innocuous. <laughs> not these bad boys, though. Oh, Whether no. it was due to the participants, the content of the match itself, or the result, the following bouts may have been short, but they sure were spectacular in their own way. I'm Adam Pachisi from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 Link to the original video squash will be down below. Join us. Number 10, Rick Rude versus Mark Starr. Right near the top of my list of wrestlers I would try to avoid pissing off at all costs <laughs> sits Rick Rude. Big, ripped, mean, and with one of the most impressive moustaches in the game, Ravishing <laughs> Rick was a feared man in any locker room. Now, I'm not entirely sure just what English journeyman Mark Starr did to irk Rude before they clashed in a WCW International World Heavyweight title match at the April 21st, 1993 Saturday night tapings, but something was clearly off from the start. Rude stared down his opponent and then proceeded to beat the ever-loving jobber <laughs> out of him with brutal no. clotheslines and a rib-shattering punt to the midsection after Star made the mistake of catching the champ's kick and forcing him to hop around on one foot. Oh. Star made another mistake when he attempted to fire back with slaps, earning him a straight punch to the jaw for his troubles. Whoa. In some ways, it was totally routine as Rude got the win within four minutes but watching it back, there is clearly something amiss. Interestingly, this was Rude's second last match ever as he suffered a career-ending back injury in Damn. Japan just a couple of weeks later. Number 9, Damn. David Sammartino versus Ron Shaw. David Sammartino might not have been close to the star his legendary father Bruno was, but you would still expect him to beat the lowly Ron Shaw, wouldn't you? Well, Ron Shaw certainly did when the two met at the Philadelphia Spectrum on November 27th 2nd, 1985, as did WWE management. San Martino had different ideas, though, and decided to throw a spanner in the works by having his opponent go over instead. What? Rather than win as scheduled, he first tried to lose by pinfall, only for Shaw to pull him off the mat at the last second, which the commentators covered for by claiming that he was being arrogant. But when Ron put him in a bear hug, the son of the living legend very quickly and very clearly submitted. Cue a lot of confusion on the part of Shaw, the referee, ring announcer Mel what? Phillips, and announcer Gorilla Monsoon. Years later, David would admit to throwing the match as a way to stick it to Vince McMahon, who oh. he felt was arrogant and playing politics with his career. Well, all I can say is you sure showed him, mate. I don't think Vince was ever quite the same. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I, I get it, him trying to, you know, trying to, I guess, prove a point, but it ultimately didn't really work in the end, did it? <laughs> Honestly, damn. Same after you lost to Ron Shaw. Number eight, Daniel Bryan versus Sheamus. Oh, this Daniel one right Bryan here. Daniel Bryan and Sheamus had to have been disappointed that their United States title lumberjack match was shunted onto the WrestleMania 27 pre-show. Even more disappointing, oh, they this was only uh... given a shade over four minutes, and it ended... Yeah, this was, this was a, a whole different situation, but I wonder if he's going to... Well, he should definitely talk about the World Heavyweight Championship match they had uh, at another WrestleMania where it kind of kicked off the Yes Movement. ...in a no contest. Thankfully, they would be given the opportunity mm -hmm. to run it back a year later on the main card with the 2012 Royal Rumble winner Sheamus challenging for Bryan's World Heavyweight title. But rather than the pace-setting banger of an opener that we were all expecting, D. Bryan instead dropped the gold to the Celtic Warrior in just mere seconds courtesy wow. of a single brogue kick. Well, and a kiss from AJ Lee. 
Good news for myself, having always harbored the belief that kissing always leads to nothing but trouble, but bad news for Daniel Bryan, whose first world title reign ended in controversy. It did get people talking, and it could be argued was uh -huh. the spark that led to the groundswell of support that birthed the Yes movement, but at the time, it was a seriously contentious decision, and it remains sure. an infamous squash match. For sure, Number for seven, sure. Big Van Vader versus Antonio Inoki. New Japan Pro Wrestling founder Antonio Inoki wasn't just a star, he was an icon and a cultural institution. One of his country's most cherished wrestlers, Inoki rarely, if ever, lost. If he did, you can bet your massive chin he didn't go down without a fight or due to some serious shenanigans. Mm. Well, he certainly had a fight on his hands when he met a debuting Big Van Vader on December 12, 1987. That mask is wild. Inoki had just beaten Ricky Choshu by disqualification in a short but feisty match when he was challenged by the Mastodon. The big man proceeded to completely swallow him up, ending Inoki's <laughs> long winning streak by pinning him for the first time in years after a completely years. one sided match in a paltry 2 minutes and 49 seconds. Damn. Disbelief turned to anger when Vader continued his assault after the bell had sounded and the Japanese fans rioted in protest. Whoa. It took police an hour to calm the situation down, and Sumo Hall subsequently banned New Japan from running the building for close to two years. Whoa. On the plus side, the convincing victory established Vader as a major star from the get go, and he would go on to be a money spinning draw for the promotion for years to come. Um, That's crazy. He, they got a real riot out of there. <laughs> you had people legit pissed. That's, that's when you know you, you did some good business. Unfortunately, they were banned from that particular venue, but that's when you know you did some good business when you squash someone that's been champion. That's like Roman Reigns getting squashed in like two minutes after having this historic reign. Granted, I don't think people are gonna riot. But, it, you know, people would definitely be like, what the hell? You know what I'm saying? But this was a different time. How they booked things was different back then. So that's crazy, man. Number six, Brock Lesnar versus Zach Gowan. Oh, this was Zach messed Gowan up, was man. overmatched by, well, every member of the WWE roster during his short, improbable stay in the company. This was messed One up. One-legged and undersized, Gowan nonetheless managed to pull off some miraculous upsets during his brief time in the promotion. And then he ran into Brock Lesnar. Uh. Or rather, Brock Lesnar ran into, well, almost through him when the vindictive Vince McMahon booked poor Zach against the next big thing on the August 21st, 2003. This Sick. episode of SmackDown. Brock had freshly turned heel and was due to clash with WWE champion Kurt Angle at SummerSlam just a few days later, so WWE knew that they had to put over the challenger strong. This Wrestling in his hometown and with his mother at ringside, Gowan was like a lamb to the slaughter and took a savage beating that included one of the most brutal oh chair shots God. in WWE history. This was The way sick. Zach was manhandled and left in a bloody heap on the floor was too uncomfortable for some who felt that Lesnar had crossed a line. Ironically, Brock actually lost the match by disqualification. I mean, sure, Gowan had his remaining leg broken in two pieces, but he got the moral victory, didn't he? Number five, that was Gold sick, bro. I was like, okay, this is this this monster must be stopped. Jesus, bro, that was so brutal in front of his mom. What's up with Brock beating you up in front of your moms, bro? What's up with that? What's up with that? Can can my boy Zach get a handshake? Can you find Brock? Can you find Zach Gowan and give him a handshake? He did Cody. I think he deserves one too. Goldberg versus Brock Lesnar. It is no surprise to see Brock Lesnar steamrolling through anyone, given mm. his explosiveness and legitimacy, as well as the fact that you know he isn't exactly paid by the hour. Yeah. However, it is altogether more this was a to see crazy moment. Else dominate him. When it was announced that Goldberg would be returning to face Lesnar at the 2016 Survivor Series, it was hard to know what to expect. Yeah. After all, the two had stunk out the joint at WrestleMania 20 over 12 years earlier in what was assumed at the time to be Demand's last WWE match. Would they now try to go out and have the epic encounter they failed to deliver on the grandest stage all those years ago? Eh, not quite. 
One shove, two spears, Spears, and a jackhammer jackhammer, later, and the former WCW heavyweight champion had knocked off his old rival in 86 exhilarating seconds. That was crazy. It was awesome, yes, but also came out of absolutely nowhere and was an unprecedented loss Mm -hmm. for the Beast Incarnate, who had been protected and definitively beaten everyone over the course of the preceding two and a half years. And that's why it was shocking, because... He, I remember watching this live and I lost my shit because I couldn't believe what I just saw. He beat him like it was nothing. And I was just like, I couldn't believe it. Brock got squashed. I couldn't believe it. Number four, the Skyscrapers versus Avalanche and Mike Blackwell. If you were a jobber back in the day, you turned up, you got beaten by the real stars, and then you went on to the next one, if you were mm-hmm. lucky enough to be invited back, that is. No questions asked, no ambiguities. Sounds simple enough, but the quality of the job guys fluctuated massively from the very good uh-huh. to the downright incompetent. Like Mike Blackwell, the man who decided to no sell the offense of. Let me just check my notes here. Sid Vicious and Dan Spivey. Despite being half the size of both members of the skyscrapers, Black. Wait a minute. Is that who I think it is? Who is that? Who? That look like, uh, what's his name? Teddy. Is that Teddy? That look like Teddy. Y'all let me know. Is that Teddy? That definitely looked like Teddy, bro. <laughs> Half the size of both members of the skyscrapers, Blackwell thought it would be in his best interest to shrug off their moves and strikes and bounce back to his feet the second he hit the mat. It was not in his best interests. Taking matters into their own hands, Sid and Dan... Hold on, I'm actually looking this up right now. I had to. Theodore. Theodore Long. Hold on. Skyscrapers. I'm just trying to check. Yeah, that was him. That was Teddy Long. Teddy Long. He was part of Skyscraper. I I did not know that. Holy shit, I didn't know that. Wow, I just learned something new. (laughs) Dan decided to give him a legitimate kicking after they finally managed to get him down long enough to win the match. Spivey, in particular, seemed to relish throwing a couple of live rounds at the uncooperative Blackwell, who, it should be noted, promptly disappeared off the face of the earth. Now, I'm not suggesting that the skyscrapers killed him or anything, but our man Dan did cryptically say... Things got worse for Blackwell when he got backstage. Oh. Number three, the Ultimate Warrior versus Triple H. They gave him Feeling the beats the even WCW more. WCW gained ground in the Monday Night Wars. WWE called upon one of their biggest and most problematic stars from the past in the run-up to WrestleMania 12. The Ultimate Warrior had twice left WWE in acrimonious circumstances before, but there was a war going on, damn it, and Mm -hmm. star power was required to fend off that evil billionaire Ted Turner. Or something like that, anyway. Making his grand return after almost four years away, Warrior certainly looked the part, and true to form, completely brushed past a hot young prospect named Mm -hmm. Hunter Hearst Helmsley, putting him away in a minute and 39 seconds. This ruffled a few feathers, since Triple H was clearly super talented, and Jim Helwig had supposedly put the kibosh on any suggestion that the two have a more competitive match. Oh, wow. As far as he was concerned, the match was all about him and his return. So why not completely shrug off a pedigree and then triumph with minimal effort, eh? The- oh, yeah, he definitely did no sell it, bro. That was kind of wild. <laughs> Game seething likely didn't subside when the Warrior WWE relationship predictably soured just a couple of months later. Number two, the Rockers versus is the genius i mean i can see triple h like well, well what was the point he's he he has issues with the company even now so what was the point of him no selling anything i did <laughs> and chuck austin it's amazing to think now but decades ago it was not uncommon for barely trained wannabe grapplers to wrestle on global television wwe needed a constant supply of warm bodies for their stars to squash and they often were not properly vetted and their inexperience went unquestioned that was the case for chuck austin just six months into his training when he somehow convinced wwe officials to let him perform at their television tapings in tampa florida 
Florida on December 11, 1990. Tagging with Lanny the Genius Poffo against the Rockers, Chuck was, in theory, in great hands with three experienced pros around him. Mm -hmm. However, Austin took Marty Jannetty's Rocker Dropper finisher incorrectly, spiking himself headfirst into oh, the mats. No. Paralyzed upon impact, Chuck Austin ended up suing WWE parent company Titan Sports and was ultimately awarded $10 million from them and $1.5 million from Jannetty. Following Chuck's accident, which has left him living in significant pain and means that he has to use a wheelchair, WWE changed their policy and only hired jobbers with a proven track record or significant in-ring experience. Holy. The tag match never aired on television, by the way, though clips of it were used in news broadcasts about the incident. Number one, Perry. Holy damn, man. Hey, once again... Yeah, he got some money out of it, but his life is never gonna, never the same because of that. And once again, respect to the wrestlers. You gotta know what you're doing out there. You do, because if you don't, it could be situations like that. You know that that sucks. Holy. Harry Saturn versus Mike Bell. Mike Bell was a name familiar to those within WWE, having wrestled dozens upon dozens of squash matches for the company from 1992 all the way up until 2003. In that time, Bell stared at the ceiling for everyone from Bret Hart and Lex Luger to Bob Holly and Mabel. The most notable match of Mike's career, however, was with Perry Saturn at the May 7th, 2001 Jacked taping. Big Pez got his bell rung during an early exchange and, according to him, entered fight or flight mode and began shooting on his opponent oh, before I think I've forcefully seen this. chucking him through the ropes to the floor. Yeah, I it think was I've an seen ugly this. landing for Bell, but it gave Saturn a minute to get his bearings. After the former European champion got the last of his aggression out by chucking poor Mike into the stairs, yeah. they finished the match as planned. Saturn was reprimanded as soon as he returned mm -hmm. through the curtain and was subsequently given the amnesia yep. gimmick and moppy storyline as punishment. Yep. You're welcome. Yep, he legit beat the crap out of him and they punished him for it. Like, they beat the brakes out of him. Well, he beat the brakes out of him, man. That's, there's jobbing and then there's what the, he did to him. So that, that shit was crazy, man. But comment down below. Let me know um, any other infamous squash matches you can think of. There's plenty of them that definitely didn't make this list. So let me know some other squash matches you can remember where you was just like, Jesus damn this this was this was uh brutal let me know down below but i appreciate all the love and support you guys shown on the channel roll to 150k and i'm still young speedy youtube wrestling champion world appreciate y'all kicking me see you on the next one peace